Amazing. Well, it's seven o'clock and we have a ton of great information to cover with our incredible panelists tonight. So let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Scholastic Awards Juror Panel. It is so exciting to have you here today. Um, we'll start with some introductions of who the Scholastic Awards staff are on the call. And then we will have our jurors introduce themselves in a little bit. Um, so I will get us started. My name is Katie Bonner. I am the Senior Manager of National Partners at the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers, which is the nonprofit organization that presents the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. And I am joined tonight by three of my incredible colleagues. Uh, Manny, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, of course. Hi, everyone. My name is Manny Blasco. I'm the Associate Manager here at the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. Um, this is my um, third time doing this um, panel, um, and I'm, I'm just so thrilled to be doing it again. There's so many of you tonight. It's so fantastic. Um, I will turn it over to my colleague, Connor. Hi, I'm Connor. I'm the program assistant at the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. Um, this is my first time at one of the juror panels, so I'm excited to be here. And then I'll give it to Amir. Hi everyone, I'm Amir. I'm the Regional Award Coordinator at the Scholastic Awards. This is my first time being here, so I'm pretty excited and I'm looking forward to seeing all your questions. Thank you all. So um, Connor and Amir are going to be answering all of your questions in the Q&A box. They are also going to be keeping an eye out for um, any questions that you want to ask to our jurors, especially your most popular questions. We are so thrilled to be tonight, tonight to be joined by four incredible jurors from around the country who we will introduce to you in a few moments. Um, but just to give you a very brief introduction now, we have Devin joining us from Baltimore, Carletta joining us from DC, Carmen joining us from New York, and Steve joining us from Indianapolis. So a huge thanks to all of you for being here. And we will turn the mic over to you in a few minutes. But before we get started, we just want to cover some housekeeping and a very, very brief introduction to the Scholastic Awards. Um, so first, a little bit of brief housekeeping. This event is being recorded. It will be shared. For those of you joining us um, in the audience tonight, your cameras and videos are not on, nor is your microphone. So. Um, one, don't worry if you're eating. I saw somebody ask that. Um, two, we can't hear you if you need to ask a question. So instead, we ask you to please put your questions in the Q&A box, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. There is a little ribbon if you hover over your screen and you can click from there, chat and Q&A. So in the chat is a great place to go if you just want to say, oh my God, thank you so much, Devin. I love that information. You're the best. And the Q&A box is a great place to go if you want to say, um, Carlotta mentioned this. I don't really know what she means by that. Maybe she could tell me some more information about it. And when you're in the Q&A box, if you see a question that somebody else asked already that you are also interested in, rather than asking it again, we ask that you use the thumbs up to upvote the question. Because when we have limited time, like we will tonight, we're going to try and get to all of your questions, but we are going to start with the most popular questions first. Um, so definitely use that upvote button to make sure that we are keeping track of what you all want to hear the most and taking the time to get to that first. And last but not least, closed captioning is available. So if you would like to turn that on, you can go ahead and click on it either says closed captions or subtitles in that same ribbon at the bottom of your screen where you found the Q&A box, you might need to click the three dots that say more, and then you should be able to click show subtitles or show CC or closed caption. And again, the subtitles will be available in the recording later. Um, and with that, just a brief overview of what we'll be doing tonight. So we are joined again by our four incredible panelists from around the country. They are going to introduce themselves shortly once we get into number three up here, our panel discussion. Um, right before that, Manny will be giving us a brief introduction to the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. And then after the panel discussion is when we open it up to your questions. So be sure that you're asking those questions in the Q&A box. And Amir and Connor will be posing those questions to our panelists right when we're done with our panel discussion. Um, and then we will wrap up with a few quick reminders about how to enter the Scholastic Awards. and. That'll be it for the night. So I am really excited. I think we're going to have a great time. 
Thank you all again for joining us. And Manny, I will hand it over to you. Great. Thank you, Katie. All righty. So I know we want to get to our panel discussion very quickly. So I'm going to try to keep this brief. Um, so I just really want to give a quick just overview of what the Scholastic Awards are. I know a lot of you are um, returners. So this may be um, not so new to you, but it's always good to have a refresher. And then especially for those of you who might be new and entering the awards this year, um, this will be a very helpful kind of just, um, you know, quick info session. Um, so the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards is the largest recognition and scholarship program for creative youth, celebrating the accomplishments of teen artists and writers since 1923. So we've been around for a quite a while. Students in grades seven through 12, ages 13 and above, are invited to submit works to 28 different categories of art and writing for the opportunity to be recognized at both the regional and national level. And in addition to the recognition, exhibition, and publication opportunities available for students, um, the awards also offers a number of um, scholarships annually, some of which come with cash prizes for educators. And you can find all of this um, at our website at artandwriting.org. Um, and then just a quick note here also is that um, there is an entry fee, um, $10 per individual entry. And then um, for seniors, um, seniors can enter portfolios. That's going to be $30, $30 per portfolio. Um, we also offer fee waivers um, available to any student, um, any, to anyone who needs it. Um, so please feel free to use those at your own discretion. And again, all of this information um, can be found at our website at artandwriting.org. And that is where um, you'll be able to enter your works. And on the topic of entering works, I'm just going to cover a little bit on how to actually enter. So um, submissions opened on September 1st. So now is the time to be entering your works. Um, it's three easy steps to enter. So the first is, again, create an account at artandwriting.org. The second thing is to actually upload your original artwork or writing work. And then the third step is just make sure to complete your entry form and payment, or again, a fee waiver um, if you um, aren't able to complete payment and just make sure you do that before your deadline. And again, there's an entry fee of $10 per individual entry and $30 per portfolio entry um, for seniors. So deadlines vary by um, whatever region you are in the country and deadlines start um, as early as December 1st, um, but you can find your own deadline um, by visiting the My Region page on our website, again at artandwriting.org. Next slide, thank you, Katie. Um, and I covered this very briefly in the beginning, um, but I just wanted to um, you know, cover again um, all of our categories here. Um, so we have 28 different categories of art and writing that students can enter, and they're all listed out on this slide here. And as I mentioned again, um, seniors have the opportunity to enter portfolios, and portfolios consist of six works of art or six works of writing, and then a personal statement and an artist statement. And seniors can enter up to two art portfolios and two writing portfolios. And you can find um, category descriptions um, for all of these here, again, at our website. And again, I touched on this just a little bit earlier as well. Um, this is a fun one here. Um, so the Scholastic Awards offers a number of scholarships annually. And the ones that are listed here are just some of the examples um, of the types of works that might receive scholarships this year. Again, for seniors entering portfolios, um, we also offer um, the Gold Medal Portfolio Award. And this is a $12,500 scholarship for students. And um, there's also, again, a cash prize for educators. And then we also offer the Silver Medal Portfolio Award, which is $2,000 scholarship for students. And again, cash prizes for educators. But you can find a list of all of our scholarship offerings and more information about each one at our website at artandwriting.org slash scholarships. Thank you, Katie. Um, and this is, you know, this slide right here is kind of the meat and potatoes of why we're all here today is about selecting award winners. Um, so first and foremost, um, during the award selection process, um, this is, you know, I just want to cover here that so um, what are jurors looking for or what are they looking at and what are they not looking at. 
So something to note here is that jurors, um, when they are going through the judging process, um, they do not know the name, gender, race, ethnicity, or any other identifying information about the artist or writer. So the only thing that they're looking at are the works themselves. And this is to ensure that the works are judged based only on the merit of the work itself. So um, what are judges actually um, using as their um, you know, judging guidelines? Um, jurors are making their selections based on these three core criteria here. The first one is originality. And so something that a juror may ask themselves when they're looking at works is, how is this work different from what others have created? Um, is it new or unexpected? Um, the second piece of criteria that they're looking at is skill. And so this is, you know, again, a, a juror may ask themselves, how are they, how is this work using technique and something like structure to express their ideas or a new idea? And then the last piece of criteria is an emergence of a personal voice or vision. And so this is kind of about, you know, is there a distinctive tone to the work? Um, you know, this is where only your perspective, your unique perspective is shining through and that um, only you could create, have created this work. Um, so, you know, all of our panelists in, this evening are jurors or work closely with jurors. Um, so they'll be able to share um, even more information um, and kind of background on what they're looking for. And so with that, my spiel is done. And so um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Katie um, who will take us into the next and exciting portion of our evening. Thank you, Manny. Um, so as Manny mentioned, that is a perfect lead in to our incredible guests for this evening who will be sharing with you all about their experience both as creators themselves and as folks with experience judging or working with jurors from the Scholastic Awards. Um, so they have incredible insights about what judges are looking for having done it, um, as well as just general advice about things you might wanna consider as you continue creating your own work, things they've considered as creators, and what you might think about as you're considering how creativity could play a role in your future beyond the Scholastic Awards. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and turn it over to all of you. Um, I would like to invite our panelists to introduce themselves. And maybe to get us started, Devin, would you like to go first? Sure, no problem. Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to be here with you all. I am actually very overwhelmed, just in a good way. There's so many people here. Um, but yes, my name is Devin Shacklett. I work for the Baltimore City Arts Council here in Baltimore as a program and grants manager. Um, I have three years experience in working um, with the Scholastic program. Um, I'll be transitioning uh, the roles for the program to my colleague, Twee, who may or may not be on this call. Her name is Twee McCullum, so you may get an email from her if you're in the Maryland region. Um, but yeah, I'm very excited to be here and yes, discuss scholastic things. Thank you, Devin. Carletta, would you like to introduce yourself next? Yes, good evening. And again, thank you for being here. I am, let's see, I work for In The Loop Program of Success. It's my own development company. I've been doing, I've been judging for, during for Scholastic for, ugh, I wanna say at least seven years. It's been a long time. Um, found it by accident and just really love getting the entries and also working with jurors um, that we work with across the DC area that are very excited to support young people. Currently a school counselor and a filmmaker, but glad to be here. Thank you, Carletta. And Steve, would you like to go next? I'm just going in order on my screen. <laughs> sure. Uh, Steve Fox, I'm the director of the writing program in the English department at uh, IUPUI in Indianapolis, uh, Urban University, uh, direct the Central and Southern Indiana region of the Art and Writing Awards, and uh, probably been doing this, I guess, 15 years, but who's counting? Thank you so much, Steve and Carmen. Hi everyone, I'm also very excited to be here. I'm Carmen Wong, my pronouns are she, her, we. I'm a poet, a playwright, a PhD student and a teaching artist. So I'm both a student and educator like many of you joining us, which also means that I exist at the intersection of art, activism and critical writing. 
I have been a juror for the past three years, um, and I'm happy to be joining tonight as an alum of the Teen Writing Awards. I'm also from Queens, New York, by way of Guyana, by the way. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Uh, Manny, I turn it over to you for our first question. Thank you. All righty, I'm happy to kick off our panel discussion here. Okay, um, so the first question um, that we have for you is, describe the most outstanding piece of art or writing that you've seen in the Scholastic Awards and what either stood out to you about this work or why has it stuck with you? Very thoughtful. Right, I'm gonna start um, only because I saw the question and it's, and I remember the piece, but I can't remember like the title. It was when I first started reading um, for Scholastic, but it was it was a poem and it, the the imagery was just amazing. And I remember reading it thinking it was about like something dark or like it was like a cage, but it literally like got to the end. It was like a a household item. It was like she did this really amazing way of crafting this. Like I was so invested in like getting to the end because I knew it was like something horrific, and it was like a dish towel or a fork. It was just the way she used her words. It was so creative, and that's what I've enjoyed the most about reading the poems. Even the uh, flash fiction is like my favorite. Like it's my favorite category to judge. But I just remember this, and I, it was like my, my first two years of actually being a juror, and it just, I still remember it, because I would just knew it was like this really horrific piece of poetry, and it turned out to be something very simple, and it just shows how words can really bring you in and create this idea, um, and so yeah, I, that's like the piece that stands out to me. So if I read, I also read for just passion within the words and creating a, a picture while I'm reading, and that's kind of what I've enjoyed the most. Um, I'll go. So I wouldn't say, so dealing with Scholastic over the past three years, it's been a lot of great work that's come. So I can't necessarily say that I have a, a favorite, but one thing I will say, the ones that definitely stood out, I would say are ones, like Carlita said, were um, inspired by passion. You know, you're using your own, your own words, your own experiences to really create the art, you know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like skill, skill is, can anyone can learn a skill, you know? It just takes a certain amount of time to learn that skill and to master that skill, but to actually put yourself into your work and not just literally like talking about yourself in the story, but like, you know, we all have different things that we can bring to the table or to the universe, if you will. So we all have something that can be said that someone else cannot say. So I will say the ones that definitely stood out to me are pieces that are personable, pieces that no one else could have created but the person that experienced that. So I would definitely recommend just, you know, staying true to your own experience. Yeah, Devin, I'll agree with that. Um, the most outstanding pieces to me have been the ones that I've wanted to return to over and over again. Um, I have read um, poems, dramatic scripts, memoirs, um, critical essays. So I've, I've read um, submissions from a plethora of different genres on purpose, um, specifically because I'm interested in seeing what young people are writing. Um, and I find that the most outstanding ones to me are the ones that lure me in. Um, and sometimes it can be about very practical ideas, topics, items, um, but done in a clever way, in a humorous way, done with thought um, and feeling. Um, definitely pieces that I am not necessarily stumped by with the language, but pieces that have me wanting to reflect and say, okay, I need to turn to this again, because maybe I need to read it differently, or maybe I need to access it differently. And then oftentimes when I do, um, I end up getting more out of it. Definitely agree with you. Oh, sorry, Devin. Oh. Yeah, and then uh, a piece that I, uh, that stood out to me, I, I read it to a group of teachers I was uh, working with this summer, is uh, a poem, uh, Blue Dashers by Alyssa Gaines, who's um, 
was a senior at the time she submitted that. She'd been submitting for a number of years. She's now in, in college and she's also the National Youth Poet Laureate. Um, so, you know, you can see the journey can lead you to all kinds of places, uh, but I love the poem because it, it takes a, a very intricate poetic form. I'm not even sure the exact word for word or if she mixed different forms, but there's repetition of some lines and the new lines coming in and then the middle of the poem, it becomes even something different for the rest of it. So the craft is very um, thoughtful and, and obviously from many years of experience of reading and writing. Yeah, but it also connects to her personal history, her family's history, to culture, um, and to the natural world. Beautiful description of insects and, and birds and, and boats on a lake. Um, and, and some words I had to look up uh, because they were just the right word, but they were very specific things that I hadn't experienced. So it opened up new worlds to me. Um, and, and that's what we look for, I think, in any piece of writing or art whatever age. Sorry, before we move forward, I just wanted to quickly add, because I've seen someone ask, were we referring to art as well? And I just wanted to be clear, like it, what what I, or at least what I said definitely can, um, you know, it correlates with art as well. Um, in anything that you do, you should definitely put your all, your passion and, just you in it. So they're definitely, yes, writing and art, same thing. Thank you all. And thank you for clarifying that, Devin. I think that um, that's important to keep in mind throughout this discussion as well. There's going to be a lot of overlap between the two. Um, our next question for you all, as Nanny mentioned earlier, the criteria for the Scholastic Awards that judges consider are originality, skill, and emergence of a personal voice or vision. What does it mean for you to consider that during judging? I can go first again. Um, I think for, so I'm a, I'm a teacher counselor. So working in schools, um, voice is really important. Like I'm constantly encouraging my students to use their voice to advocate for themselves, for others, but also just to learn how to speak confidently. And I think, and I'm talking about writing, um, I've only judged writing and reading poems and flash fiction, or even some portfolios, just being able to recognize their strength of voice and them finding themselves through words is really important. And I love the criteria because it gives you a lot of um, flexibility to give students um, I think um, Carmen mentioned it's not about like the word usage per se, maybe a slang or even other types of vernacular. It's really about what they're saying in, in, in the poem or in the short story that's really most important. And that's the skill and vision you're looking for, right? What vision does this young person have in telling this story or shaping this image, like I mentioned earlier? So I think I, I love that Scholastic, you know, gives like just four basic categories and then you're able to kind of pull from the pieces, you know, how those things apply. And originality is so important because every poem is gonna be different. You judge them individually, you don't compare. And I really appreciate that as well. Cause I can walk away and come back and not have to think about what did this one say? Did it really match up? It's all about that one person in that one moment in time. So once I turn to the next entry, it's a, it's a blank slate, like Tabo Russo, I start all over again. And I think that's important for all of the young people to realize that you're not being compared to anyone else. It is your voice, is what you have to say, is your story. Then that's most important. So stay true to your voice, like Devin said. Just believe in yourself and that what you're saying matters and is important. And I know I take every poem, every story as an individual piece of work that's very personal for someone. And I give it that much attention in judging. I think to build on what Carletta said, what I really like about Scholastic Awards is we're not picking the one winner overall, even in a category, um, so we can recognize a variety of works. And the criteria, I think, help uh, all of our jurors uh, kind of check their own personal preferences and say, now, you know, maybe I don't respond to the topic of this piece or this work of art is in a uh, does something different with the, the medium than I'm used to, but they look at the criteria and remind themselves, do I see skill here? Do I see it developing? 
um, do I see some some originality? You know, nobody can be totally original. We know that as artists, you're always borrowing and mixing. Um, but where's the uh, originality in how you mix materials and ideas and voices? And and then there's something there. Um, so I think the judges work very hard to look at um, each piece and say, what do I see there? What can I recognize and validate? Because I don't have to compare things and, and make one stand above everything else. Yeah, I'll jump in as well. Um, I, I judge writing um, individual submissions as well as writing portfolio. So I do wanna make that clear. Um, and I agree, I think that the criteria is there um, mainly for judging purposes, right? So that way we have something to hold on to. And like what you mentioned, Steve, even if this isn't something that speaks to my experience, does it do this, right? Is this original? Does this person have a strong personal voice, um, uh, a sense of person, a sense of self? Um, embedded in this work. Um, and so that's meaningful in the judging process. Now, what I will say is, as someone who has um, been reading submissions for the past few years and reading different genres of submissions, um, what I find more um, specific to critical writing versus maybe creative writing um, is that I tend to read submissions that are surrounded around um, similar themes, right? Which means that maybe this is a class of students um, submitting work, which is great. And I, I, I recommend that because that is a way to get your work out there. Now, what I will say is part of this process is making sure that you have an individual voice. Um, and so after reading submissions from you know, let's say 20, 30 people around the same topic, you're looking for something that's memorable. You're looking for something, or we're looking for something that's memorable. We're looking for something um, that is unique, somebody who has um, a personal voice that speaks to something that maybe someone else didn't um, out of the 30 readings that we have um, encountered. And so I think just as um, advice to those of you who are submitting. And again, I say this as someone who is in that process and submitted to Scholastics as well, that that is important. And when I look back um, at my experiences, I wish I, I knew that it was okay to say these guidelines exist, these criteria exist, but what's really important is that I'm sharing the stories um, I'm sharing the things that are important to me, and I'm doing it in a way that honors my own journey as a writer. I just wanted to um, quickly add, so I myself was never an adjudicator, but I was a part of the process of selecting um, the adjudicators for both writing and art. And I've also read a lot of different works and seen a lot of pieces. I'm saying all that to say, so I, and I've also talked to a lot of the adjudicators after the process, you know, as debriefs, wrap ups, things like that. I was saying that to say, uh, I can't stress it enough. And um, Carmen, Steve, Carlita, we, I think we've all been kind of stressing this, is be yourself in your work. Like, like once again, skill, skill can be learned, um, but make sure that your work, whether it's art or it's writing, that it's a genuinely aligned with who you are as a person, genuinely aligned with the things that you believe in, you know what I'm saying? Like, cause we can, judges can feel that when they're reading the work. When I, I'm not a judge, like I said, but I've read a lot of the work and you can feel when someone is just a great writer and someone who is passionate about what they're writing about or someone who is technically an amazing painter or someone who just, you know, created a paint, I don't know, create a painting about their cat who meant something, you know what I'm saying? Like it's, it, it matters. The feeling that you put behind whatever you do matters so much. I can't stress that enough. Be yourself. I think that is definitely the key takeaway um, from what you all said. Thank you so much for sharing. I think that was awesome. Um, Alrighty, so um, the next question we have here is, um, what do you all think about or what do you advise students to think about when selecting works to enter into the awards? Uh, 
again, I guess I'll jump right in. Adding to what I just said, literally, if you have a catalog of work, which I'm sure a lot of you probably do if you're artists, um, yeah, what pieces speak to you the most or what pieces do you feel like represent your story the most, whether that's an actual written story or, you know, a painting? What do you feel like when you look at that, it's like, man, I'm so proud of this. Like, those are the pieces. And outside of the work that I do, I'm also a songwriter. And I, I, I'm able to recognize work that I've created. Then it was okay. It was okay. But when you create that one, you know what I'm saying? You know, and you feel it. And once again, it goes back to the feeling. Um, outside of skill, the one that one piece that makes you feel like I have to get this out there. And then also keep in mind of the American Vision, I want to say that's the correct term, and American Voice Awards, those, I mean, I mean, if you just took, take those two titles, they, they, like, literally the program is encouraging everyone to be themselves and to be them, be their best selves and express the art, you know what I'm saying, the art that they've, the skills that they've learned to, you know, get to where they are, so. Yeah. I'll say really briefly, I advise everyone to submit work that represents you, um, your voice, your vision, um, and very plainly what you want to see in this world. Um, so that that's my answer to that. Um, but I'll also add, I was once sitting in um, a, a workshop, a program with Nikki Giovanni, and she was saying, you know, I'm a, I'm a great writer, I'm a great poet, right? Speaking of herself. Um, and she was saying, I'm a great writer, I'm a great poet, not because I write great things, but because I know the difference between when I write great things and when I don't, right? And so what that really means is making sure that there's a process to your craft, to your submission process, um, to your submissions, uh, making sure that you understand the value of editing, revision, um, talking people through what it is that you want to write, um, and getting that work done, right? And so not necessarily turning in your first draft, but maybe turning in your second or third or fourth draft, right? Not hesitating to revise, to take things in a different direction, spending time with the work that you want to see in this world. Okay, that's so funny. Uh, thank you, um, Carmen. That the, the teacher in me just kind of popped out when I saw the question because I tell my students, ask, ask three before you ask me. And that goes to even in the submission process, read it to yourself, read it to someone else. It's important to share your work and your voice because having someone provide feedback, but not just that, find things you might've missed. And I, as a, I'm also a doctoral student, I have to read a lot and read it over and over again in my own work as well. And so that revision process, when you walk away and come back, does something. And so once you create a piece or two or three, put it to the side, walk away, whether it's a day or a couple of hours and come back to it and then see how you feel. And I definitely believe that, like Nikki, Nikki, Nikki Giovanni says, you know what's good. Like, you know when your work is like, you know, like Devin said to you, like, yeah, this is like, this is hot. Like, this is nice. And, and 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 lean into that, like and trust your gut. And if you read something, it's like, mm, it's okay, then trust that as well. And maybe you need to walk away and come back to it. Maybe you start over again. And, but just trust yourself in this process of knowing you know what's good and you also know what you're producing. And is it something you want others to associate you with? So, because if you win or you're recognized, and somebody reads it and sees your name, would you be proud for them to say, hey, I saw your work. Like I was reading this book and I saw your name attached to this piece of work. So just take pride in what you submit. And so that knowing whatever you submit might be recognized on a national level, international level. And will you be excited to know that you receive that recognition? Uh, I, I agree with what everyone said. And I think it's important um, that teachers not um, make students submit something to a, an award contest like this because you have to be committed to it personally you, as Carla said you want it to be out there you're willing for people to read it not okay fine my teacher wants all of us to submit so I'll submit um, or yeah I did this it was pretty cool but I spent one night on it and I'm done um, you have to be invested in something enough to 
share it with other people and get feedback, honest feedback. And you won't always follow the feedback or agree with it, but you got to be willing to hear it and see how it makes you think and uh, what you go back into the work to do. And since I'm not as familiar with visual arts, I don't know what that revision process is like, but I'm sure there is one and that, that uh, uh, artists who work with their hands and with uh, tangible things as well as writers um, reshape, rethink, um, and, and, and maybe sometimes that's even more painful <laughs> with a material object that you think, oh, this thing's a mess. I got to start all over. That's, that's hard to do. Um, but when you're willing to do that, that's the work you want to submit. And I also just quickly add, um, also, when sharing your work with other people, um, again, and everything that I'm saying, please just, it's just my opinions. It's nothing is facts. But when you are sharing your work, work with other people to edit or draft, whatever have you, you know, peer edit, make sure you trust that person too. Um, because a lot of sometimes, you know what I'm saying, let's just keep it real. There are people who are haters and there are people who are mo your motivators. And you have to be able to discern who people are in your life first and foremost before you just give them your work to judge. Because somebody may tell you something that's bad just to give you that bad feeling. You know what I'm saying? So it also ultimately it always comes down to how do you feel about the work? For me, how do you feel about the work? Are you confident about the end result? Um, and of course, you get other people's opinions. But again, make sure you trust the opinion that you're getting. Thank you all so much. Um, I think that your answers actually really lead really well into our next question as well, which talks a little bit about the courage of sharing your work. So what advice do you have for students who may be nervous about using their authentic voice, knowing that their work will be viewed by others? And in the case of the Scholastic Awards, as you mentioned, Carletta, possibly published next to their name for a national audience. I say do it because you never know who you're going to help and support out there. Like there's so many times I've had students share something in a group or a class and others later on say, I'm so glad they said this. And that's what your work is going to do. Like your story, your voice, somebody out there needs to hear what you have to say and take that as a badge of bravery, courage, and honor and submit, like submit scared, submit uncertain because the best, the worst thing is to not to have submitted and you wake up 15 years later and, and really wonder what could have happened had I just shared this one poem or shared this story. Because people read these works and they're moved. Like even I can say what I've read, I've shared with others. And even as um, Steve mentioned um, with the Blue Dasher, I think he mentioned is how, like how that he shared with other professionals. So just share because you know you're not the only one out there. That there's somebody else out there who's gonna feel you and your words and they need that just to keep going. Yeah, so I'll add to that. Um, writing is a process of healing and we heal this world through healing ourselves, right? And so I wanna bring to the center, not my own words, but the words of self-proclaimed black lesbian mother warrior poet Aji Lord, right? Who says, when I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in service of my vision, then it will become less and less and less important whether I am afraid. And that is what I turn to all the time. I was a young writer um, submitting to awards like this and other awards as well. And I was often afraid, I'm, I'm still afraid when I submit, when I publish, um, has that stopped me? No. And I think um, part of what I have learned about that fear is that it is because I understand the work that I am doing is serious work, right? And because it's serious, I have a certain intentionality about it, about how I go about submitting, about the things I go about writing and how I begin to share that work with whom I share that work. And so I think part of that fear is stemming from the importance, the significance of what you have to say. So if I could leave us with anything, it would be do not live in your own fear. Okay, I gotta say something because I love Audre Lorde. Like this, like I, I, I absolutely, and it's her, the quote I thought you were gonna say was that 
When we speak, we're afraid our words will not be heard or welcomed. But when we're silent, we're still afraid. So it's better to speak anyway. So it's better to write that piece, share that piece, because you just, you know, you just, just oh, I love Audrey. So I'm sorry. That's my Audrey Laura fangirl moment. Bye. <laughs> Yeah, that was definitely a word, definitely a word. I definitely agree with both of you. Um, and I also want us to keep in mind, I believe you all said in the beginning that no one's name or anything is on the work. So that's one thing. So we, we're not, people, the the jury, the jury is not literally looking your name up and looking you up and seeing who you are, okay? <laughs> Just reading the work. Um, also keep in mind, kind of like something I said earlier, we all have a different story that it is our responsibility to let it out in whatever way that we let those stories out. And so I'm a, like I said, I'm a songwriter, I sing, I do a lot of um, different shows in Baltimore. And every single time that I perform, I'm extremely nervous. And now um, like friends or like close supporters, they, they tell me like they would never recognize that. But I do everything, I'm saying that to say we all, have that feeling of nervousness. And I think we may need to change the word because that same feeling, you know what I'm saying? It's more, for me, it feels like this is a lot of energy behind whatever it is that I'm producing. And so you're literally feeling all of that energy. And because, you know, I guess I'll say um, the general consciousness is, you know, what, what we know of our feelings and our body is very, you know, limited, but that's a whole enough conversation. Um, nervousness doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing. It's nine times out of 10, it's because it's a lot, like I said, it's a lot of energy behind what it is that you are producing. And sometimes, you know, by the end of the day, you just know that you're in control of that energy. You know what I'm saying? You can calm yourself down. If you need to take a few 10 deep breaths, you know, go talk to your mom or someone about why you're so nervous to submit. I think that really helps as well, like speaking out your fears. And then you can actually hear yourself like, why am I scared? Like, I am a writer. I am a painter. Like, this is what I do. So there should be no reason why I'm like, you know what I'm saying? Like, just do, literally, and I do this with myself. That's why I'm saying it like this. But you literally just have to speak out your fears and like really look at yourself like, you plan, but yes, that's my two cents on that. Uh, I don't have too much else to add other than artists have always been people who take risks, but when you're young and we, we have students from, you know, 13 all the way up to, you know, seniors in high school, and maybe at a different point in time, you're ready to take the next the next risk and maybe the next one, and you have to start somewhere, but I'm not telling you in your own situation what you should risk, um, but that's why I look for a trusted person, especially maybe a, a mentor and a, a, an adult, whether it be a family member, a teacher, a, a community member who can give you advice if you're worried about how are, how are people that I that are in my life going to receive this if you feel it'll hurt a relationship or something I, i'm not telling you to take that lightly but get somebody's advice um, and i would also say the cool thing about art is frequently you can take things that are happening to you or have happened to you and transform them with just a, a few changes so that it isn't like you know going on some uh daytime tv show and tell spilling it all out there you can transform things you can turn if you've had a relationship with a, a brother that's difficult in your story or your art it could be a sister or a cousin or you know it could be an animal so um, art gives you the freedom to turn direct feelings into something um almost um magical and creative that won't immediately spark the reaction that our words sometimes do or that our displays of emotion do and allow people to absorb something that they couldn't otherwise handle um, and be kind of changed by that. I, I want to add one last thing too um, and that is don't let the fear of submitting or the fear of publishing stop you from writing right? Um, I think just being able to, again, heal yourself 
being able to share your own stories, your own experiences validates you, validates you in this world. And so I encourage you to write that thing. And then maybe in the next step, right, we talked about process, thinking about, well, is this something that I want to see in this world, which I mentioned before. Um, and over time, we ask ourselves, you know, which stories are ours to tell, right? And, and those come up, I think, in the publishing process. But I think just in the writing process, I encourage you to just write, to do research when necessary, and to write, right? To feel and to experience and to write. Amazing. Thank you. Seriously, thank you all so much for sharing. I, so much great advice here. Um, okay, so we have um, one last question for you all before we turn it over um, to the Q&A box. Um, and this is going to be a lightning round. So it'll just be, you know, quick answers that you guys have. So the lightning round question is, what is your final do's or don'ts? So things that students should be doing when they're entering, entering the awards or, you know, when they're cre just creating in general. And, and the don'ts. I think we covered a lot of them, but you know, um, any final last, <coughs> excuse me, any sort of final last um, things that you have to share? Submit, write, do it. <laughs> I say do submit with intent. You know, don't just submit because you're educated. Um, paid for your submission. Someone said a really good one. Don't plagiarize. Absolutely. And maybe just a, a sort of logistical thing. Make sure that the program you're submitting to can get in touch with you. So use an email that you actually will check, even if it needs to be a Gmail instead of a school mail, because school emails can be very hard to reach sometimes. Um, use your parents' email if they'll let you something, because we sometimes do need to reach out to you and say, hey, we just need a signature, or is this your check? Um, or do you know about this opportunity? So make sure we can get a hold of you. I'll add, um, you know, something that I wish I would have known when I was in your seat as um, those submitting, young writers submitting is, you know, I think sometimes we think about this as this grand prize, right? Like I have to submit, I have to be able to win something. When I think, um, I wish I knew then that the prize is being able to say I finished writing this body of work that is worth sharing with the world, right? Um, and so I just, for me, the do is to make sure that you write something authentically, um, something that is meaningful, something that is purposeful, that speaks to you and your experiences so that when others encounter it, um, they are encountering um, a version of you on the page, right? They're, they're, they're encountering um, something that is real. They're encountering something that was worth writing. I'm sorry, I know this is a lightning round, but I think this is very important. Also, before, well, please make sure that you submit, do, do the, the payments and, you know, if, and don't allow having to pay for the work, the submissions hold you back. Cause when I say the fee waivers are for you to utilize, like it's, you know what I'm saying? Like really utilize that. If you, if you cannot afford to pay $10 for your work, definitely utilize the fee waiver and do not let that hold you back. Thank you all so much for sharing. Um, and Devin, I think that is a great note to end our do's and don'ts on. Be sure that when you are entering, you are taking full advantage of the tools available to you, including the incredible advice from our jurors tonight. Um, and with that, I see that we have over 350 questions in the Q&A. So we are going to get to as many of them as we can. Um, <laughs> Amir and Connor, I know you've been keeping an eye on those. I invite you to come on and uh, start sharing what, what the incredible teens in our audience are looking to know. Uh, definitely. Um, our top question here is, what makes an award-winning art piece? But I guess it could also be writing piece or any piece. Skill and passion.
Yeah, I, I think something that's memorable, right? So you have to take into account that you are submitting. Um, and again, I'm speaking for the writing awards because that's what I have experienced um, judging, but hopefully some of this is applicable to the arts awards as well. So when you're submitting, you're submitting to a specific genre, right? Like there's a specific category. Um, and as we, we know, um, certain categories have their own conventions, right? And so oftentimes it's wanting to show, like you mentioned, Devin, the skill, right? It's wanting to show um, that you have experience in this type, this style of writing, right? But more importantly, it's going beyond that. It's saying, I understand the conventions of these writings. And so if I choose to break it, I understand what I'm doing, why I'm doing it. Um, if I choose to expand it, if I choose um, to, you know, play with form a little bit, whether it's in a poem or it's in um, a prose piece, um, just that, that confidence and that ability that I think exudes from the passion that you mentioned, Devin, right? So it's all of these things combined. And to add to what um, both Devin and Carmen said, I think it's important the, when I think about award-winning pieces that they actually fit the criteria that they're placed in, that you know your work enough that you are going to select the, the, the category that most applies to what you're submitting. Because sometimes I've gotten works, so I'm like, why is this in this category? Um, so that you know, is really important to know your work enough to know what category it fits into. And then lastly, just make sure it, um, it's free of grammatical errors. I can't stress that enough. Um, Award-winning pieces are grammar, you know, have proper grammar and punctuation. And that, that does, in my opinion, count against you in some categories. Alrighty then, and we do recommend if you're having issues deciding what category to apply to, we have a gallery online on our website with past award winning work so you can look at and kind of see what people have done there. That's been um, at least successful in a sense with the Scholastic Awards. Um, our next question is, are there any cliches that you guys see often in creative writing or in art that you would advise students trying to avoid? I wouldn't say avoid, but um, when like current things are happening in our culture, if you're going to talk about it, um, understand that there's probably 300, 500 other students talking about that same topic. And so this goes back to um, putting yourself into the work. Like, what was your perspective in this scenario? You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, I'll say that. I agree with what Devin said mainly that is the, I think even Carmen mentioned or somebody you're in a class, you're all writing over the same topic. And so you're like reading 50 poems and they're all talking about the same thing and there's nothing unique about it, nothing personal. Then that becomes very cliche. It's like, okay, so you're all talking about terrorism. You're all talking about bullying. You're all talking about, you know, um, basketball. So just really important to, you know, own the piece in a way that makes it unique to you and your voice. Um, helps it not be cliche-ish. Even if you're all writing about basketball, your perspective should be different than somebody else's. I know jurors have, have talked to me about uh, in, in writing, um, and maybe the, some of the art jurors see it as well, but a lot of interest in, in death and a lot of killing <laughs> and dying going on. And I don't think that's necessarily a, a cliche. I think it's a, a universal human thing and young people are often trying to grapple with it. So I try to tell the jurors, I say, well, when you read a lot of stuff or you look at a lot of art, it may overwhelm you in a short time. But I say, that's what that's the thing that young people, they have questions about and so they deal with in their art. But it, to avoid a cliche or to avoid making something seem trite like, this is the same science fiction monster story everybody has read. Just try to change one thing and, and bring something original to it. So people that read science fiction or that look at a piece of jewelry or whatever, they may have some expectations and you can fulfill those expectations in a pleasing way, but surprise them with one little element that they weren't expecting. Maybe bring something from a different 
genre or a different area of art into that one and that makes it seem fresh. Our next question is, how might I stand out with my work? Again, practicing that individuality and staying true to yourself, staying true to your beliefs, um, your everyday walk, just staying true to who you are and making sure that people can recognize that in your work. All right, for our, oh, if you wanna go, Carmen, go ahead. I'm just gonna quickly add, right, for full, for, for full transparency, it's important to know that you're submitting your work with a myriad of other writers across this country and other US territories. And so that is well beyond um, a thousand um, other submitters, right? And so this idea of, you know, how do I submit the best thing, right? Um, it is about how to separate yourself, right? I think oftentimes um, the work that we see being awarded some of the highest honors um, are works that are able to separate themselves from the masses. And there are several ways to do that, right? Sometimes it is by avoiding cliche. Sometimes it is by using things that are typically cliche um, and giving it a spin, taking a new, um, taking on a new, um, a uh, spear or a new face to it, uh, being able to spin something. Um, but I think it's also just really a, a part of the craft, right? It is practicing writing over and over and over again and understand, understanding the concepts um, and conventions of, of writing and being able to utilize that, right? Um, figuring out what works to your advantage. Um, and so, you know, just trying not to be vague here, just part of it is just being able to, yes, write the stories um, that that you enjoy writing, right? And not that you just think will win something, right? Um, and hopefully it does win. I don't know if that is necessarily um, the best answer, but I think in the long run, um, well beyond your teenage years, that is the best way to look at it. Sweet, thank you. Um, so for this next question, um, so the awards ask that when students draw inspiration from another piece, whether that's a famous artwork, a movie, or an anime, or I get a lot of questions about students using like Studio Ghibli as a reference, that the work be transformative um, when it is like kind of submitted. So how do the judges like measure the transformation a student applies to a work? Like how do you guys view the sources students use or the inspiration that work might come through, come from when you're judging. I would say that if I am able to recognize the reference, but only because you said something that brings it to me, right? So you've transformed the work in a way that it feels familiar, but I'm like not sure, but it, it, but it still has your unique presence or um, perspective so that I no longer see that work, I see your work. It's like in theater, if you go to a show and the actor embodies the part, you forget that they're whoever they are, you feel they're truly this person. I went to see, um, Mountaintop, I think Samuel Jackson and Angela Bassett were playing the, and, you know, they are great actors, but they didn't embody the role. But I saw a small theater do it here in DC. And I think I'm Amon, I forget Amon's last name. She, like, I believed her. Like, she, I forgot that she was Iman. She was the character. And so that's the best way. If you're going to reference anything, know that make it so that the person reading or seeing this this work forgets whatever you're referencing and sees your piece and takes from it whatever you're trying to give i know i was talking to somebody the other day about 
fan fiction. That's something a lot of people are familiar with. And there's probably a similar thing in art. Um, and it's not that something interesting and original couldn't come out of that, but you want to be careful that you're not just borrowing a storyline, characters, or images, and and just say, okay, and, and and what if they did this, and what if they did that? That that may be risky, um, and might be fun, but it might not be the thing that shows you as someone with a personal voice or vision. Um, I don't. There's no perfect generalization. It could work but more likely would be um, parody or satire is a way of dealing with something, you know, like, so people have written, rewritten uh, a classic work of fiction, or they've taken a painting and uh, sort of done a, an homage to it in a different way. Um, and that can work, but it's, uh, it's, it's tricky, but hey, sometimes you have to take those risks, but just don't um, be in so in debt to the thing you're borrowing that you really can't escape from it. Yeah, I definitely agree with Steve. Um, I a lot of the work that I've read that that's referenced other work I've noticed like they kind of use the reference as like a like kind of like a spinoff more so than like using the whole story so like i don't know alice in wonderland after alice in one like an alice in wonderland idea but instead of being in her wonderland she's outer space i don't know but the point like you know what i'm saying like you're you're using the story the original story but you're still once again making it your own like or if a cinderella story from a little black boy's perspective that sounds very different, but it's a reference and it, it could work. But like Steve said, it is definitely tricky to use references because I've also seen pe people's work be considered plagiarized. I also worked um, on the committee, you know, dealing with the plagiarism work, checking work and things like that. And a lot of work students thought they were referencing, but it more so came plagiarism. So it's tricky. That can be done. Yeah, actually, when I heard that question, I was thinking, my mind just went to poetry. And so I was thinking of like, well, what happens if you submitted an ekphrastic poem, right? Poem that's written after art, or if you're using um, certain quotations um, or things like that. And I'll, I'll just say, speaking for myself, um, if I am reading a piece like that, I look it up. <laughs> if someone is referencing an artist or referencing um, someone else's art in their work, I take the time and I look it up because I actually care about what you're writing and I care about what I'm reading um, and I care about the references you're making. So um, I, I do think um, part of that is, is also recognizing your due diligence in making sure that you're crediting this and that it is attributed. Um, and once you know I can see that and I realize that you've um, done the work on your end, then I'm willing to do the work as well. I was gonna say really quickly, it's like in Tazaki's um, char poem for Color Girls, she mentions like quite a few things in there and I had to look them up, but because I really enjoyed the work, it wasn't a chore. It just made me appreciate the words more. So giving references and, and credit isn't necessarily a bad thing. Definitely. Um... Next question, this one's pretty good. Are there any topics that we should stay away from, triggering topics and such? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Are there any topics that we should stay away from, triggering topics or things like that? So I'll just say really quickly, right? Toni Morrison says it best when she says, you know, language has consequence. And so part of that is recognizing um, if what you're writing is offensive or violent um, or how it can be perceived in that way. So being mindful of that, but should you stay away from a certain topic because you think that um, it's either personal or you think that it is, or can be conceived as transgressive or, you know, whatever the case is. No, I think that you should write the thing you want to see in this world, right? And, and think about it 
um, is how, you know, just by writing that you have the power to, to do something about it, right? To, to change people's intellectual thought around this um, and, and, and to mobilize, right? And so, no, I don't think there's things that you should specifically stay away from unless it becomes, um, it, in, unless it incites um, violence or, um, you know, it's just extremely offensive to a group of people, um, whether or not they share your identities. Just adding really quickly, I think the intent behind your work is very important also. So like Carmen said, there's not necessarily a topic that I would say stay away from, but if you're gonna go, if you're gonna talk about a controversial topic, why are you talking about that? And um, like, what's the purpose? And you know, what's the intent behind it? Or are you just doing it to be edgy? You know what I'm saying? Like, there's a difference. If you right. don't mind, sorry, Connor, just to jump in from afar. Um, in addition to all of the incredible points that you all made, I just want to add a policy from the Scholastic Awards. There are no, no themes or topics that are off limits. Um, we value freedom of expression. So technically speaking, you can enter work on any topic or category in the awards. And I'll also point out that a, a judge, a juror can recuse themselves from a particular work that they, so maybe it would be triggering to that particular juror. And so they just don't judge it and somebody else will do it in their place. So we, we allow for people to, just like there are certain things you don't wanna read, you don't wanna watch, you don't wanna look at, at that moment in your life. We, we give judges that same option. All right, thank you all. And thank you, Katie, for jumping in. Um, this next question, what do um, you all jurors, jurors, jurors look for in a title of a story, artwork, or poetry? And like, what's an example of a title you've liked? You said title we've liked? Yeah, of like any piece, doesn't have to be one you've judged. But for Color Girls, is like my all-time favorite Charles poem. <laughs> I'll say a title that leaves mystery for me, like um, the girl that couldn't, the girl that couldn't stop crying. Kind of, you know, that was off the top. The girl that couldn't stop crying. Like, why was she crying? Those are the type of titles I kind of gravitate to. Like, why was she crying? Yeah. I'm thinking of like the color purple, right? But then I'm, it's also bringing me back to like the Kamehi River Collective and thinking about lavender, right? So I'm thinking about titles um, that are referential, right? Not just, um, cause when I think about writing specifically in art in general, um, I think about it, the ways in which we produce work that then is entered into um, a lineage or legacy of writers before us, right? Of artists before us. And so, a title could be referential um, to other art, or it can be referential to your own work, right? And so if you are even submitting um, perhaps a portfolio, you might think about something um, that either, you know, evidently, obviously, clearly, um, or cleverly um, binds these pieces together, right? Especially if you're struggling to figure out, well, what is the threads between these pieces? Um, or you say it's there, but I really want to pinpoint that. Okay, fantastic. So we have another question here. Um, what are you looking for? What should you submit into a senior portfolio? Like, what are you looking for in a senior portfolio? That to me is really hard because if it was like my student and I saw them and knew them for four years, I could see growth and like, oh yeah, I'm looking for this. I think you just want to submit your best work um, that represents you. I don't know if I have a, I don't, I don't, I don't personally have like, oh, I'm looking for this, 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 this. Um, I, I look for good work, 
you know, that speaks to me, that's authentic voice and that shows the depth of the writer's, you know, ability. Again, I'm talking about writing because I've only you know, just writing submissions. I don't think I would have a particular thing I'm looking for. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I think in terms of um, a portfolio, I'm thinking for me, it's it's about um, expressing or doing something differently than a singular piece of, of art um, or writing submission can, right? And so that can be being able to expand on an idea through several pieces that can also be um, allowing different voices and different perspectives to enter in, um, especially if you know you don't have the page limit to do so in a singular um, piece of submission. So I, I just think that the writing portfolio is it's very unique in that you have, I think, the capacity to do so much more. And with so much more, you have to figure out well, what are the limits, right? <laughs> like, how do I figure out what all needs to fit in this portfolio? Is this supposed to fit in another portfolio? How do I gauge that? Which work speaks to which work that I want to submit for this specific portfolio? Um, so I think just in terms of, of um, examining and, and being able to um, engage writing portfolios, um, it is, I think, in a sense, getting to know the writer a little bit better, right? Um, spending more time with their work in a way that, you know, we're not typically able to do um, with a singular submission. Um, I'll just quickly add, again, I'm not an adjudicator, but I've noticed the work that has been most interesting in regards to portfolios. And this doesn't have to be this way, but I've noticed that they all kind of each piece kind of plays off the other or all the all of the works kind of tell a story or tell that stu student story in a way. Um, and then the ones that are kind of just like, you can kind of tell that students just threw it together. Like, oh, I have, I have 10 photos. Let me just add this and make this a portfolio. Like you can kind of feel, again, intent, 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 intent is very important. Like tell your story and make it make sense for us. I think that's very important. I also wanna add one more thing and say that um, I'm here as a recipient of the team um, writing awards because of the writing portfolio, right? And so um, all of that is to say, it seems tedious at the time when you're a senior in your high school, you have to submit all of these different things into a portfolio, but I wanna encourage you to use that to your advantage because in order for you to be um, at that juncture of your educational career, you have to have been writing you know, and turning in work. Um, and so this is the time to maybe refine that, to edit that. Um, maybe this is the time to actually mesh that with things you've been writing outside of class as well, right? Um, so again, just use that to your advantage. Nice, thank you. Um, and Carla, did you mention liking judging flash fiction earlier? Yes. We've, we've had a few questions about, you know, what like judges are looking for under that category or how to separate that from like a short story that might be a bit small as well. Like, what advice would you really, give there? I'm just really impressed about being able to tell a full story in a short amount of time, you know, and the stories that I feel like full, like, that was a great story or I feel um that the writer really captured I love imagery you know and flash fiction it's like it gives you just enough without like too much to kind of get you like engaged and involved and they can wrap it up just really nicely and I also had a few pieces that just left me hanging and I just wanted more and I was excited by that writing just the fact that I could read this piece and I'm like, okay, what, what else do they do? You know, um, is there something else I can find? So it's twofold. It's one where I'm excited about writing that makes me want to figure out what's next. 
And I'm also just as excited about writing as a really full, robust story in a short amount of time. And I feel like they did a really good job of making sure that it was it was a nice, you know, package closed up. But I also love opening it up and still like, okay, where's the rest of it? Um, so. I just wanted to quickly add, I've been reading the chat and I just don't want the art students to feel unloved. Like a lot of what's been being said, it it, it works both ways for both writing and art. Um, please be encouraged. Please, you know, submit your work. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add that really quick. I did see a few people uh, kind of sad about the <laughs> influx of writing um, things, but kind of all kind of coexist. It's all ultimately about being yourself, submitting work that you're passionate about. Thank you, Olivia. <laughs> and I will add, sorry, as a creative, creative as a filmmaker, that the thing about, <clears throat> and I haven't judged art part, so this is me just adding to what Devin's saying, is that art is also about passion and you putting your all into it and you knowing what looks good and what doesn't. And so having that same kind of philosophy when it comes to photography or paintings, when you put together those submissions to really believe and like what you see and want others to appreciate it and really be open to knowing what they think of your work. Like you may create something and really not know what others may look at it, what they'll take from it, but that gives you more fuel to the flame to do more, to do more of that. And then with photography is about your eye. Like, what are you seeing, you know, and capturing the essence of something that might be small to someone else, but you capture in a way that really speaks to um, another person. So my little bit to encourage all of the, the art people out there. Okay, Greg, here's another good one. What will you as George be looking for personally in this year? This is art, but anything really. I think it's very important to study that criteria, the scale. Don't get me in line right now. I'm having a brain fart, but one of y'all, please jump in and help me out. Um, but definitely understand the criteria before submitting the work. <laughs> I think that's all, uh, you know, it's important to know what you're submitting. And, and that goes back to what we all say is like, don't submit because I told you to submit. Submit because you want to submit. So you understand what we're looking for and what the requirements are. That's the biggest thing um, in any competition, not just the art and writing one, just knowing why you're submitting and, and make sure you're submitting what meets the criteria of the competition. If you're submitting art, here's just a thought because I've, you know, not judged art personally, but work with a lot of, of folks who do judge it, and and many of those folks are artists themselves in in the medium that they're judging. But you might so you might ask an art teacher or an artist you know in the community when they submit things to art contests or, or want something to be, see if it'll be displayed in a show or a gallery. What has their experience been? What are, what are people looking for in that, whether it be jewelry, painting, drawing, photography, any of these architecture, fashion, what are things that, they're, that they see people looking for? What will they notice that makes them think, well, you're not quite there yet. Um, uh, because each of those artworks, you know, the writing, it's all made of words, even though there are genre expectations, but the art has so many different media that people are working with. And so talk to somebody who's experienced in that area, I think, to get some good advice. Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, I saw in the chat, people were like, well, what's the criteria? So once again, it's originality, skill, um, emergence of a personal voice or vision. Now, um, I also saw in the chat that you guys were talking about um, script writing. Um, so how it works, um, to be very transparent, in my experience, it has been um, before you even begin 
judging any kind of writing, um, we as, as potential jurors get to say the categories that we might have an interest in judging, right? Um, and so I know for me, I oftentimes select more than one categories because I have an interest in reading um, different, different genres of writing. Um, dramatic writing, script writing is one of them. And that's something that um, ever since I started reading that category, that's something I look forward to all the time. Um, I am a playwright, um, but specifically, I just, I think that I experience the work very differently on the page when I'm reading um, scripts. And oftentimes I'm looking for work that, yes, makes me feel, but also makes me laugh out loud. Uh, makes me feel like there are different characters talking um, in different, you know, voices. They have their own perspectives. They have their own breadth of experiences. Um, I also teach playwriting and I teach poetry workshops as well, right? And so one of the things I always um, tell my students um, is making sure that, that you understand the character's full life and breadth of life before they even came to this page, right? And so um, how does that translate then to people who are meeting them within the span of maybe 10 minutes, right? Um, so those are the things that I'm often um, looking for. And I'm thinking about it very practically, right? Like I'm thinking, well, does it, does it do this in terms of, you know, um, not necessarily did the character achieve their wants, right? But in terms of the technical aspect of the writing, right? Is there um, a clear, you know, focused character? Is there a drive? Does this have, you know, um, a certain, you know, uh, thing that it wants to achieve, right? And so part of that is also recognizing maybe when I'm reading scripts that aren't not meant to be linear stories, right? And so is it serving that purpose as well? Um, if it's experiential in nature, okay, what are the conventions of this? How is it playing? How are these writers playing um, with those conventions? How are they maybe being intertextual at some point? So all of these things are things that I'm thinking about um, when it comes to poetry. Um, again, I teach uh, poetry writing as well. And so I'm thinking about, well, if someone says this is supposed to be in a certain form, is this actually in a certain form? Um, or are they playing with form? Is this something um, that they're thinking about, right? Does it have that kind of um, capacity to do these uh, numerous things um, that we're called to do as, as poets? Um, so, yeah. Um, I want to speak, but I do agree. I don't, I'm not a playwright, <clears throat> but I read a lot of scripts as a filmmaker. And the best scripts are the ones where I not just laugh out loud, but cry. Like I'm sobbing at the end, or I'm so committed to a character. Like I'm like, why did you mess with Jillian? She was the best person in the story. They're like, Carletta, it's just a character. I'm like, but no. And so those are the kind of like stories I want to see on screen because I know from the paper, it moves me. And if it's brought to life, then it's going to do something amazing. So like that's when I read scripts and, and I haven't read any scripts for Scholastic, but just in general, when you're writing things like that or even plays, when you can read something and you see the character. And I can't stress enough about voice, like having character with a very unique voice. And the character development is so critical. Like you should know everything about your character, even if I never see it on the page, it never comes up in the story, but knowing who they are as a person. Terry McMillan said in one conversation, she was like, yeah, I'm writing this book, but you know, this character stopped talking to me. So I couldn't write for two weeks because she wouldn't you know, talk to me. And I kept thinking, what do you mean she wouldn't talk to you? Like you're writing this character. But she was like, that's how engaged, you know, connect she used to her characters. Like they become people. And so she was like, that character took two weeks to kind of develop because she like was stubborn. She just got fed up with, you know, what she was trying to do. And they finally came to an agreement and she finished the book. And I just thought that was like really hilarious, but appreciated how she was so candid about her process because they are people, you know, um, on a page, but still people. Um, this is just a general statement in regards to works submitted, but um, Carmen and Carlita hit a great point and it's about emoting emotion regardless, um, allowing a reader to feel your emotion through your page or your canvas, um, it's very important, so yes. It doesn't always have to be said, like just as much as someone may be inspired by a sad come up story, someone may just as much want to hear a story about something happy. I don't know. There's a lot of craziness in the world right now. So we can use some happy moments. So 
expand, open the box, jump out the box. Oh, real quick, just to pick up what Devin said about it, it doesn't have to be happy or sad. Like even when you think about like the holidays, it's not always happy for everybody. And I think it's about that true when he talked about your experience, your story, like that's what makes the biggest difference. So don't feel like, well, all my poems have to be happy or, or, or sad or whatever. Just speak your truth. And, and that'll be what makes you stand out speaking your truth. All right, thank you guys for answering the questions from the Q&A and the earlier ones. I think we'll move on to next steps, Katie. For... Yes, that's perfect. Thank you, Connor. Right before we do that, I do just want to pose um, one quick lightning round question to you all. We have gotten a lot of questions about specific categories and different topics that can be covered. Um, but one question that we've had come up a lot is, when you're thinking about the criteria, what are kind of, um, how, how do you weight the three different criteria that you're thinking about? Originality, voice or vision, and skill. So, um, I don't know if I give them any more weight than others. If I had to pick one, I would probably say voice because that feels like the most personal, but I really work to look at the piece as a whole and give the, the writer, the author, the, the full chance of all three areas. But if I had to select one, it would probably be voice because I think originality, you know, we all take from different things. So basketball is not that original, but it's your voice that makes it, you know, pop and stand out. I agree. I'm not sure that I um, have put like a definite individual weight on like how much this, how much that. Um, but for me, I do think um, something that I'm very mindful of, right, is that I can turn to a category like poetry and receive a plethora of different kinds of poems, different styles of poems, um, different poems that have um, poems that have different content by nature um, versus if I'm I'm reading like the essays category I could get submissions and it could just be because of the submissions that I receive versus maybe submissions that Devin receives in the same category that might just be about the presidential election right and so for me it's it's not about saying um well is this more original than someone who comes up with their own topic right but it's about saying well, how is this work or this writer being original to this topic, right? And so um, for me, it does alter, I think, depending on, on category, I think it has to. Um, I, I do wanna say, and, and I believe this is true for, for all of us judging, at least, you know, I hope so, that the idea is to support and encourage and foster a new generation of young writers, right? And so what that means is um, being able to take these criteria um, and being able to apply it in the best way to the works that we're reading, right? Um, and so it's not that, oh, this person doesn't do this, but how are they doing that? And is that different from how I have to read it? Um, is this challenging me to read it differently, right? And so for us, that is spending time with your work. And I think somebody asked in the, I noticed in the questions about, you know, is a technically very sound landscape or still life uh, not going to be awarded because there's no personal vision or voice in it. Um, that's a tough one to answer. Um, and and I, I hope maybe you'll talk to some other artist about that. And uh, But I think a, tr a tremendous level of skill will be admired by the jurors. It is, it is something important. They are going to care about that. Um, but, you know, it's not like it's just an exercise in showing I'm really good 
at painting or or setting the f-stop on my camera or 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 doing manipulating the metal to make a, a sculpture um, there has to be some purpose in it some something that reaches out to a viewer and that's just hard to capture but yeah p judges and jurors will admire somebody who's worked hard to develop your skill your craft craft's important especially when you're young you can't be sloppy you can't ignore that so it is valuable it is very valuable but i will add um my director uses this example all the time um there was a program who, whom, uh, after school program, excuse me, for juvenile delinquents, you know, students who kind of did not have, you know, probably what you all have in this chat, um, the opportunity, the same opportunities. And they kind of, the grammar, the grammar was kind of all over the place. You know, the, te the technicality part was not quite there. And again, technicality is very important, but just keep this in mind. Um, there was a student that received honorable mentions, but also received American Voice one year. So it's possible. Uh, so in, in saying that, it's like technical, te being technical is very important, but I think your story is much more important. So don't allow those little small things get in the way of your submissions. Like literally, submit with your pet, or let's go back to the whole peer editing, trusting your, ed um, your peer editors or whoever's reading your work or looking over your work. Um, use that as an opportunity to kind of, you know, go back over the technical things, but like, just make sure you're getting your story out there, because I think that's very important. Thank you, and a huge thank you to all of our jurors again. Um, it has been such a pleasure having you. Uh, if everyone will please join me in giving them a round of applause from a home. I know that they can't hear you, but they can feel you like Peter Pan and Tinkerbell. Um, and a huge thanks to all of you for joining us today. As Devin mentioned earlier, I know that we've been having a lot of questions specific to art. So I just dropped in the chat some um, tips from jurors in the past about entering your artwork and what jurors are looking for specifically for art. And as a reminder for next steps, please visit artandwriting.org to get started today by creating your account and or uploading your work. Take it from wherever you are there. And once you create your account, you'll be sorted into a region where you can find your deadline. As a reminder, deadlines do vary by region beginning December 1st. So make sure that you are getting online and checking your deadline so that you know how much time you have to enter because we wanna see the incredible work that you're creating. Thank you all so much again for joining us. A huge thanks to Devin, Steve, Carmen, Carletta, and a thank you to Emir, Connor, and Manny as well. Have a wonderful evening, everyone, and we hope to see your art and your writing soon.